Hi, everybody. We're going to do a new series where I'm trying to add more fun stuff. This is uh, should be fun and very uh, enjoyable, I think. It's a Bible quiz. Yay! And it's multiple choice, so you will have the answers in this particular episode. And uh, you'll be on your own to, uh, if you wish, you can report to me the results uh, of how you did. And uh, if you don't want to, you don't have to. It's just if you wanted to share, that'd be fine. And uh, this is uh, will also include Bible history. So it's not just simply a Bible paragraph or words, uh, but also some history. So we'll uh, keep doing that. There'll be 10 questions each time. And so you can score yourself on a percentage basis. So if you get uh, 7 of 10, you scored 70%. If you get 9 of 10, you're 90%. So uh, see how you do. And the answers are there, more or less. Uh, but some are difficult. Some are difficult. I'll, I'll highlight what those are. Okay, so number one and two. So just to show you how this works is on the left side is the question. Uh, and the answer is in green. So one of those names, Paul, James, Jesus, or, or Peter. So that's basically it. So the numbers will be on each side. So you know, one is on the left, one, two is on the right. Okay, so who said this? So the words below that are the question. Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Who said this? Was it Paul who said that? Did James say he that God made a choice among us, that he would be the, the, the one to whom the Gentiles would hear the gospel? Was it Jesus who said this, <laughs> that God had made him a choice? Or did Peter say that God made a choice among us that the Gentiles should hear by Peter's mouth? What do you think? I'm going to give you a few seconds to think about it. Write it down if you want to write it down. Otherwise, just make a mental note. The answer is Peter in Acts 15, verse 7. Yes, he said... Uh, Men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God made choice among us that the Gentiles would hear by my mouth. Hmm. Okay, well, so let's look at question number two on the right there. Uh, who said it? Who said this? Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry. So who said this? Is it Paul said I'm the apostle to the Gentiles? Did James say he's the apostle to the Gentiles? Did Jesus say he was the apostle to the Gentiles? Or did Peter say he was apostle of Gentiles in another place. So we'll see. Who do you think that is? Take a, take a moment to write that down if you're keeping score, and we'll see the answer now. It was Paul said this in Romans 11.3. Very interesting how this contradiction can exist and nobody seems to care. But I think it's important. Why, why did Peter, Peter believe he was the apostle of Gentiles? And Paul thinks he's the apostle to the Gentiles. So it must have been something that Peter didn't know about, that Paul th thought he was chosen. And Paul Peter was chosen in Acts 10 with Cornelius and the Gentile and all of that. And that happened well before Paul had shown up uh, you know, in Acts 15 to go to the Jerusalem conference. And yeah, well, anyway, Paul, for uh, most of his epistles, says he's the apostle of the Gentiles. So we'll continue now. Number three, you see the questions at the top. Who took Judas's place as the 12th apostle? Then you go to the left, three. You have going to have a choice of these three names, Barsabbas, Paul, or Matthias. And the passage will be from Acts. And it says that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell and the lot fell upon. Who did Jesus pick by the lot? That's what they did. They prayed to the Holy Spirit and they let a lot make a decision. Was it Barsabbas? Was it Paul? Was it 12th or was it Matthias? So take your time, write it down, make a note, and then see how you score. The answer is, it's Matthias, Acts 1, verse 26. Okay, next question is, at the top, you see there, for did Paul think he was the 12th apostle? So that's either a yes, he did think he was the 12th, no, he didn't think he was the 12th, or we just don't know. Which one do you think that is? It's one out of three chance to get that right or wrong. If you're not sure, take a guess. Can't hurt. Okay, so the answer is no. Paul did not think he was one of the 12 because he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 5, he's talking about uh, those who saw Jesus resurrected, he said, and that he was then seen of Cephas, which is Peter, then of the 
12. And he meant to exclude himself because in the next verse he says, and I saw him last of all, you know, when he was on the road to Damascus. Okay, so clearly Paul did not think he was one of the 12. So we know who the 12th was. So Paul is not one of the 12 apostles. And uh, I remember an elder, he, I was like, he was shocked when I said that Paul isn't the 12th. Uh, an elder of a Lutheran church thought that Paul had been the 12th apostle until I mentioned, no, there was this choice of Matthias in chapter one of Acts. So believe it or not, people who've been Christians for decades don't know that who was the 12th apostle or that there was anyone other than Paul who was the 12th apostle. So this is something to keep in your mind. Okay, now, this is a history, history type question. Which German reformer said this? this is question five. If you look below on the left, you'll see a box and, you know, a text, and it says, the spirit of the apostles is not a guide equal or greater than the Lord. Thus, Paul, within his letters, does not have as much authority as has Christ. So did Luther say that in 1520? Did Karlstadt say that in 1520? Karlstadt was his partner, and the co-founder of the Reformation, actually, for the first few years, he, Karlstadt, was the leader because Luther had to go in hiding after giving his speech. So for two years, Karlstadt was left running the show. Was it Karlstadt? Or was it Buser, who came along pretty much later and became influential in the Lutheran church later? Could What do you think? So the answer is... Karlstein, in his book, Canonis, Canonisis <laughs> Scripturis, 1520, it was a book on how to determine canon. And so he put Paul in a level of canon inferior to Jesus. This infuriated Luther, and he, he did a campaign against his friend, his former co-reformer, and had him driven out and, and uh, exiled from uh, Wittenberg. And basically made, rendered him penniless. And uh, but Karlstadt eventually survived. He became a professor in Basel, Switzerland. Okay. Anyway, which of, now question number six: Which of these three books of the New Testament did Luther's 1522 Bible say in the preface were uninspired? Did he say this about James? Did he say it about Revelation? Did he say about Jude? Did he say about one or more of these? Did he say it about all three? So you have a couple of options here. And this is where it gets a little tricky. When you have three options and they could all be right, they could all be wrong. No, they, there has to be one that's uh, applicable, but you might pick uh, the wrong sequence or whatever. So take your time, make your decision, and I'm going to reveal the answer. It is all three. He, in his preface, did not have the regard that everything in Scripture is Scripture. He did not have the false version of 1 Timothy 3.16, as we all do in our English Bibles. Because uh, the last, the uh, the earliest English Bibles, Wycliffe and Tyndale, did not have that infamous is. All Scripture is inspired, only came about with the King James. Maybe there was a, another one that attempted this uh, fraudulent edition of the word is. But the King James put in italics, and then in their preface, if you read carefully, it said that when we italicize things, it's not really there, but we think it'll sound better if we put it in there. Well, it materially changed the meaning. All scripture inspired of God is useful for edification, edification, of course, but that's totally different. But to say that all scripture, anything written is inspired of God is a very dangerous predicate because now uh, things that, you know, anything written is scripture and therefore it's inspired. So it was a kind of a... A, a crazy thing to say. You can't, that can't be true because the word scripture only means writing. It doesn't mean holy writing inherently itself. But uh, anyway, so whatever you might, might want to conceive is fits within the word scripture is what you can just say that's inspired because it's, that's what the verse now says. But it didn't say that when uh, uh, Luther translated and Luther didn't have that translation. He didn't uh, even think about it. And uh, so that's just, it's totally something manufactured in English Bibles. Okay, number seven. What was solely responsible for Paul's sinning? Paul is an interesting person who, who blames one single factor for all his sinning. So in number seven on the left, you see there's three options. Was it a wicked woman he had met? Do you remember that story? Uh, was it bad books he had read? and been influenced by him. You know, he seems to have read a lot of plays and went to a lot of theater things and 
been very exposed to the uh, the Greek arts. Could that have been it? The bad books? Or was it reading the law's commandments? That that couldn't be it, could it? So your choice, make your decision. Did Paul say the sole responsibility for his sinning was one of these three things? Well, you, you think probably you know the answer. It's the law's commandment. I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Apart from the law, sin was dead. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a blasphemy. Do not believe this. I'm putting it in there just for an interesting question. It's just a quiz show here. This is in Romans 7, 7 to 8. That's verbatim King James Version. Shocking, isn't it? But that's uh, what he said. Uh, question number eight, does Paul say God intended the law to bring life, but unintentionally brought him death instead? This is a very ooh, strange question, but the answer, what is it? Yes or no? Could it possibly be he blamed, he, he, he had God trying to bring us life and didn't know what was going to end up happening would bring us death? Well, we'll find out. What do you think? Yes, no? Let's see. Yes, in Romans 7, 9 to 10. Well, what are the words? Can we hear it? For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. So something God ordained to life was death to him. Because see, reading the law is how you sin. If you didn't read it, you would never, you would never have sinned. It's the law that's to blame for everything. That's why it's a blasphemy, ladies and gentlemen, because it's insulting and disparaging the law. You don't want to even follow it. And I, I covered a video earlier today. Numbers 15, 119 ministry says what that means is Numbers 15 is saying if you disparage the law of God so people don't want to even follow it, read it at all, you have committed a blasphemy and you are, you are to be expelled from the community and you have committed the unpardonable sin. So don't repeat any of this. Don't believe any of this. I'm just letting you answer. You're getting a couple of points on an, an exam. I think these were the easier ones of all. You could figure it out. Those on this channel who are regularly here, you can figure it out. It's just amazing how people who are Christians just read these passages and they just gloss over them and they don't understand what they're reading. And that's maybe a good thing. Maybe God is protecting a lot of Christians to not re even understand these. But now they have to learn these things because all of us have to become fighters for Christ to know and tell people, ladies and gentlemen, this is is wrong thinking. This is blaming God for our sin. This is blaming uh, uh, our, our uh, that th God had an intention that the law would bring us life and he didn't think it through and it's only going to bring us death. That as if God has a lack of wisdom or foresight. This is, this is exactly a disparagement of God himself that he didn't know what he was doing. I digress. Okay. Finally, we're up to our last two questions. So which ending did Paul say A or B? We're going to show you A or B. And let's take a look. Did Paul say, so Paul says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are, is it A, not authorized in God's law? So are all things lawful for me, but all things are not authorized in God's law? So he has some restraint from the law or B, uh, all, things, uh, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. So is he just a person who would have this amoral doctrine of just, is it inexpedient to do something, the costs outweigh the benefit kind of guy? That's that's amoralism. You know that, right? Which one do you, but he wouldn't pick that one. So this is an easy one. It has to be, has to be A, right? Well, let's see. So, so write down your answer before I show you. Is it A? No, it's B. Oh my gosh. How could this be? 1 Corinthians 10, 23, not expedient. How can he speak like this and be a person who be people believe is a man of God? It's crazy stuff. Create The world is a crazy place. It's hard to understand it. Okay, now number 10. We have choices A, B, and or C. The question is on the top left, 10. Why did Luther reject Hebrews as canonical due to uh, Hebrews 3, 1 to 3? We have three things that are true about the verse, but maybe not all of them are what he grounded his disagreement with it upon. So be careful about this one. You could you could make a mistake if you don't remember or know the this is in an article online on uh, the epistle to Hebrews that we have. So those who re read that maybe know the answer here, but take your best guess. 
Was it because Jesus is called a high priest in 3, 1 to 3, and this thus could not be God? Is that why Luther rejected it? B, it says God, now by the way, I'm, I'm not endorsing the epistle to the Hebrews, but I, I want us to see Luther's way of thinking and that there's a the one epistle that claims that in, in, in Hebrews 1 verse 8 is the only, it used to be, was the only verse in the New Testament that actually said Jesus was God. There was no other verse. Now there's a couple more because the NIV has been very creative lately. And um, so this epistle that said that Jesus was God in, in Hebrews 1, 8, actually elsewhere in chapter 3 denies that he's God by virtue of these things and a lot of other things there. So it's a very, very strange and self-contradictory epistle. And that's why Luther doesn't like it. So, but is, are these the three grounds or one or more or none of them? So Jesus called A, Jesus called the high priest and thus could not be God. B, it says God made him, which means Jesus is not God. So use this verb in, in Greek, it's poisanti, and it means made. And it's typically translated as appointed, but it's actually poisante means made. And C, it says this man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses Again, implying Jesus is not God if he is comparable to Moses in any sense. So which of these three or all three or one or more, less than three, more, maybe just one, maybe two of these do you think is true? A, Jesus is called a high priest. Is that going to catch the attention of Luther? B, it says God made him, which means Jesus is not God. Did he catch that one? C, it says, this man Jesus was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Did he take offense at that? So take your time, write down your answer, and I'm going to reveal the answer now. It's A and C. He definitely thought that it's ridiculous that Jesus could be a high priest of God if he's God. Why would he have that role? It didn't make sense to him. And he did not catch the issue about Poissante being, being saying that Jesus was made. Uh, so that came up later. There were others, uh, others later who then said, Hey, this epistle can't be from God because it says Jesus was made. Remember the Nicene Creed says he's begotten, not made. So woo, the Poissante went right the other way. So this is, this is why after the Nicene Creed, this epistle went on shakier grounds, uh, at, at some point and then C, but he didn't catch it. And C, it says, this is, uh, he, uh, Luther believes C was also ground. This man, Jesus, was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Well, you know, that is like, it, it, that should be a duh. If he's God, he has to have more glory than Moses. Why would we even compare him to Moses? There's no comparison between Jesus and Moses. So that's that was his second basis for rejecting the epistle Hebrew. So I showed you earlier that he had rejected um, Jude, Revelation, and James, but he also rejected the Epistle to Hebrews. So he rejected four books out of the New Testament. And that should allow us to also make a statement to some of our friends who believe that the Protestant movement was founded on a basis of the the uh, integrity of Scripture being inviolable, that it had to be all 26 books. The actual founder of the Protestant Reformation re rejected four of them in the 1522 preface to the New Testament. How about that? Is that ever, that's never mentioned. Anything that's embarrassing is just simply hushed up and buried and you can't, you, you, you just have to be willing to read and, and run across all these things and make notes. So anyway, uh, that's it. I hope uh, you'll those of you want to share, send me your score, how you did. I'd be curious. And and were any of these questions things that made you uh, uh, learn something you didn't know before that you found interesting? And um, and if you need any uh, citation to where some of this is, in case that's uh, not readily available to you, I'm happy to give you links. Okay. God bless. Take care. Ciao. Good night. And uh, Shabbat Shalom tomorrow.